Hi, I'm Mara Webster, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And we're so fortunate today to be joined by the fantastic Megan Gans, who is one of the co-creators and an executive producer on Mythic Quest. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about was filming season two, because you just recently wrapped shooting the season. And, and obviously with everything going through the pandemic and COVID, that's changed what sets look like so much. And, and even when you think about the show, the fact that the majority of it takes place indoors, I was really curious about how that's impacted impacted not just the filming itself from a logistical standpoint but also how you've had to think about the scenes that you were writing and the way that you were approaching them. We were thinking that probably on the other side of the quarantine people might not want to be constantly reminded about the pandemic but we wanted it to seem like it was a world where COVID had happened and so we had to adjust some things and then when we went to shooting we had a lot of practical concerns like we have an 80 year old man in our cast. Um, and, uh, and so we really made some creative choices to isolate him as much as possible, protect him in every way that we could, and also reduce crowd scenes and like all the things that this um, productions had to do to cope with COVID. Tons of testing, um, you know, uh, all, all sorts of safety protocols that, um, really, I think, made everybody at the end of the day realize how much we loved the show and how fortunate we felt to be working there because we were willing to go through all these things in order to get it done. And uh, I'm really excited because now we're in the editing phase, which is so much easier to do remotely. So it's all downhill from here. Uh, and I'm really excited for it to come out and for people to see it. And you don't you don't get swabbed 60 times unless you have huge passion for the project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really tested it's like how much do you want to write comedy for a living? Because you're going to every other day you have to get a Q-tip in the back of your throat. Um, but honestly, it was it was really amazing to see everybody rise to the occasion. And um, we brought in a whole medical team that had you know, a little experience working with productions before and they've just learned everything about our production and um, how we work and and it was a, you know, it's such a collaborative process television already, but it was 10 times more collaborative because you had to be 10 times more aware of what everybody was doing. And one of the most exciting things about getting beyond that first season is it really gives such an opportunity as a writer to start diving into further layers with a lot of these characters because you spend a lot of the first season really building up and giving the audience who they are. And then you get to the point where you can really start playing with expectations and discovering completely different sides of them. And, and particularly if you are entering them into a world where COVID has happened and we had that quarantine episode, which really showed us, you know, completely different versions of all of these characters in a beautiful way. So what's that journey been like writing the scripts for the second season and just having that opportunity to find completely new depths in all of these characters? Um, well, it's great. So the second season is always a ton of fun because the first season you do all the hard work of establishing the characters and sort of building the framework that you're going to, um, of how you episodes work and finding all the fun combinations of characters that are giving you really uh, um, great dynamics and good conflict and all sorts of things. And then in the second season, you get to switch all those things up. You, you kind of know who people are, so then you, you can dig a little bit deeper in a lot of the ensemble, you know, season one, we focused really on um, Ian and Poppy because they, they were the two main characters. They were the story that everything kind of hinged on. And this year, we're really getting to like explore everyone else that works at the company and um, fun, different pairings for them. And it's just, I mean, it's a joy. Second season came like so easily as far as the ideas for the episodes and everything. It was more like whittling them down to the 10 that we wanted to have in the end. So it's all its all new ideas in the second season. It's all, it's all really exciting. And actually this gave us some jump, good jumping off points um, uh, because the video game industry obviously had a very interesting ride during the pandemic, you know, but like, obviously people are playing games more than ever, but it's difficult then for those companies to support all that gameplay without being able to go into their offices. So they had to switch everything around and work remotely. And so we talked a lot to Ubisoft, to our partners about like how that is going and where are the awkwardnesses. And I think that played into a lot of the fun that we had in the, um, in the quarantine episode that we did. And it's so fantastic that you have them as such a partner on the show to also be able to have them as that incredible resource, like you were just mentioning. Uh, what what was some of the research that you found yourselves doing specifically for season two? Because obviously you did a huge gargantuan amount 
before writing the scripts for season one and, and then as you can continue to develop them and and now you've you know you already knew this world but you've probably learned a huge amount that you hadn't even discovered before so, but what was the research that you found really helpful going into this season um you know we did a lot of we played a lot of games which were recommended to us a, a lot by the uh the cast you know um ashley birch and um imani and uh the the, the girls all play lots of games and they got onto animal crossing over the pandemic so they they really tried to get us in to recommend some things for us to play. And um, so I did a little research there, but I would say more than exploring the um, the video game world, because we have Ubisoft as a partner that can tell us anything we need to know about that. We, we brought some of the um, actors into the writer's room this year and just tried to research a little bit more and like figure out who they are and how they're funny and how they you know included them in the stories about their characters and how we were thinking about the arcs of the season and I think that really provided a lot of like rich research in the sense that we got to know them you know in, in the first season I think actors are always like terrified that they're going to be fired at any minute so they're they're very standoffish like in a way or at least just they're very nice but they're like frightened you know and so this year it was like you're okay you're okay and that letting letting them kind of participate in the conversation and it and it I think really paid off because we found you know the best characters are somewhere between the character you wanted on the page and the actor that you hired to play that person so I think this year we kind of zeroed in on some of those things and um yeah and when you have the cast, you know, especially a cast like this come in to play these characters, it must be such an incredible experience to suddenly watch them inhabit these characters and to discover different aspects of, of who they are, kind of taking the scripts and putting their own interpretation. Are there aspects of any of the characters that, that the cast really found and uncovered or, or created that maybe you hadn't even anticipated within who those characters could be? Um, yeah, you know... Charlotte was a real find in the sense that Poppy is was such a important character to us and we really wanted to conceive her well and and make her you know the 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 fear is always that you write a, a, a character that's just walking into every room and telling the guys not to have fun you know stop be be more reasonable gentlemen like I'm here the fun police and we just really didn't want to make her that but we really wanted her to be a very intelligent very reasonable person to offset Ian's more fantastical ego sort of big like uh dreamy weird swinging axes around kind of like that guy so we needed a contrast and I think that with Charlotte, we found that you could make her say really mean or like <laughs> you could really push her as a, and because she's so sweet, like you, you just wouldn't believe it or it, it wouldn't um, make you dislike her. So we realized kind of early on the first season, um, oh, she's just as much of an egomaniac as he is. And that's what's so funny about it is that she's not walking into every room being like, stop having so fun, much fun. She's more being like, I want to be the one who's having the fun. And then she takes over and it goes all awry. So we were, I think that was a, a huge discovery. And I think that that was just because Charlotte brought this like very particular goofiness that we kind of tapped into and um, had a lot of fun playing. I think in the same way, um, Jessie Ennis, uh, she wasn't even in the show when we first conceived it. Um, she just came in to uh, um, audition for something else. And we were like, she's hilarious and fantastic. And she just has this very, you know, this energy that she was just always giving to, um, to Rob, you know, just like really fixated on him as this assistant. And we just found that dynamic so funny that she's David's assistant, but she's just like this really intense. And that kind of grew into this thing where we realized like, oh, she's just addicted to power. That's like her thing. <laughs> she, she just follows it wherever it goes, you know, up the food chain. So yeah, I think there was some fun stuff like that. Um, this year we, we delve into um, CW a little bit more into Brad's life. Um, we, we really, um, start, I don't know, just finding more about these people because, um, when you work with people in a workplace like that for that long, it's just naturally going to happen. <laughs>
Well, with this ensemble of characters, I think that's one of the things that you're so phenomenally talented at is writing ensemble characters because there's such a challenge to it because you sometimes have characters who maybe are coming onto screen for two or three minutes in an episode throughout the season, but we have to have such a complex understanding of who they are, what are their wants, what do they need, what do they desire in life, you know, what type of person are they, what was their background and their family life like. So how how do you as a writer approach that challenge of really making sure that no matter how much time a character is on screen, that it's so richly layered? Well, we just, we talk and talk and talk endlessly about who they are and why they do things and why people do things in general and things that happen to us at work and stories about people we know that are sort of like that. And we just really, I mean, we've had so many more conversations about the the moments that you see with the characters um, uh, in that make the actual episodes uh, because, that's the whole fun of it. That's how you find all the stories. You know, it's just, it's being in a room with a, a bunch of our talented writers and and actors and just being like, what what could happen? What could happen to these people? Like, why, how would they react to this thing? And, um, and, you know, I think there's also, it's really important to be open, to not go in thinking you know exactly who a character is um, and hold that firm through casting and the whole evolution of the show. I think the best and most successful shows kind of find that magic and chemistry with their actors and the show grows into something that um, neither party really conceived of when they started. Yeah. One of the things that's always really interesting in watching the show as well is the variety of of ways that you have everything be at stake within the episode. You know, it feels just as intense to have a group of young women who are interested in coding coming to the office and them trying to figure out who's going to talk to them and inspire them mm -hmm. as it is them trying to goad out a bunch of Nazis in the game who could potentially financially ruin everything that they've been working for and building. Are you consciously thinking about the different levels and the different layers of stakes that you're creating for these characters to make sure that there is always something and there's something that's really high stakes as kind of an overarching, but also at the same time, like those smaller elements throughout an episode? Yeah, we, we, when we look at the season as a whole, we try to have episodes where there's like global implications within the game and then episodes where David has a cookie and he's trying to teach Brad and Joe a lesson because I think that's what workplaces feel like for most people, especially people that work in the video game industry. They really are controlling worlds. They are, they are in charge of these um, productions that are that that are massive global that there's so much expectation about so much ego dr driven into so much everything the stakes are very 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 high um and uh yet people are petty and they they steal each other's yogurt from the refrigerators you know at work and they do all the same things and all the same you know whether it's in the pentagon or um Oh, I was going to say J.C. Penny, but I think that's because I'm from the Midwest, and I don't know if that exists anymore. But anyway, the the point is, yeah, it's 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 having that balance between the two things, and um, I think that's where you find all the joy and fun is that contrast. Um, like in the Nazis episode, um, it is an episode about what are they going to do with this global, like this this big problem that they have, but also it's an episode about how Brad wants to waste David's time, and so basically that's what's happening in the episode is he's just stalling and running David through these paces because it because it amuses him or it buys him like a little extra time to you know chisel some money out of the Nazis uh, you know who's to say but the point is like I think that uh, stories are most successful when they have both of those elements because the smaller elements are obviously what you and I like key into but then we do want to see people do extraordinary things which is why that it's that's we, why we picked that specific workplace to do the workplace comedy in. And the people that work in the video game industry, you know, to, to the points that you were just making are so mm -hmm. phenomenally talented and what they weave together visually and storytelling wise is really, really remarkable. And it's something that's so frequently in movie and TV shows that they've always been featured as the butt of the joke, but this show really celebrates that talent. How much does that feed into a lot of the character decisions that you're making whenever you're writing an episode, just making sure that you're always, you know, even if you are making them the butt of a joke within an episode that as a whole, it's still really driving this feeling mm -hmm. Positivity towards them. Yeah, well, I think, um, well, one, we don't feel like it's a dumb, silly thing that they're doing. Um, so we don't, we don't have the impulse to make fun of them about it because I think because we've partnered with people that work in this industry and um, love video games, and we, we definitely didn't want 
we wanted to make it a, a loving homage to to all these games, the people that do all this hard work. And to what, to, for us, what's funniest is people that are really, really passionate and care a lot about their work getting in each other's way. That's That's more funny than us as the audience laughing at people who are wasting their lives doing something. Um, and I think that any workplace, as I said, can be looked at as pointless. I mean, I often think what I do is so utterly ridiculous because I'll have a day where I'm like, I don't know, exchanging emails about how to make a a vase look like a butt or something, you know, just like something so pointless. And then I'll be like, my job is stupid. And then I'll meet somebody that's like a scientist that works like on something groundbreaking. And I'll be like, God, I just, I feel like I should be doing something like that in my life. And they're like, oh, but I love the things I come home and I like laugh to the things that you write. And you just realize like everybody, it's this, it's this interwoven like tapestry that we're all doing. And so everyone's job is like super relevant and not relevant at all. And that's why we tried to keep it. I, I think like the core of the show is really the dynamics between the people that work there. And hopefully that's what you're coming back for is not whether or not the game is going to be successful, but like whether or not these people are going to be able to not kill each other on the way there. I think that's like the, the more resonant thing we're trying to talk about. And one of the aspects of the show that's created such a connectivity has been the way that you deal with women in gaming, you know, which is a subject that has been explored in in other series and, and movies. But I feel like you guys found a really unique way to present it. Were you really specifically thinking about how you wanted to find a different voice and a different way of presenting a lot of those themes when you were writing? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely we want to deliver it comedically because um, I think things that are delivered as a very dry lesson don't really land. So we we started that whole idea um, of the girls can code coming to the office because we thought it was funny that they would come on the one day that Poppy wasn't there and then they would have to be scrambling to find another <clears throat> woman to show to them, um, which was our way of being honest about the industry while also keeping it light and and funny. It's not that no women work there. It's just that, yeah, it's a, a, it's a, growing, it's a growing percentage but as we try to show with our actual cast, um, a lot of the women occupy lower levels, like the testers and the assistants. And Poppy is a real um, uh, uh, outlier. To, to She's very unique for the position that she's in, as young as she is. And so we wanted to treat her as unique too. So um, something I'm excited about for season two is that we get into a little bit more like what she thinks about women in the industry. And how her perspective might not be the same one that the testers would have about it. Um, and uh, and I, I really enjoy that because it's like, there's a there's a little edge to find. It's it's not like everyone just totally agrees on every topic, you know, there's, there's some, I think we found some um, funny stuff for her, just her feelings about, you know, having come up through a really tough environment for women and then now having all these women pour into the industry and what she feels about that. And like, I don't, it was just, um, yeah, we're, we're definitely going to keep talking about that stuff just because it's disingenuous not to include it. And because we do have so many women on our show and um, I don't know, it's just something that has always interested me as well. So um, we'll definitely try to keep finding interesting and ways to deliver that medicine. <laughs> Great. I wanted to jump into some of the questions that, it, that are coming in. Um, this one from Simon was asking about, was wondering if a dark, quiet death, about dark, quiet death, and if you were nervous about audience receptions for such a cool and very different episode, because it's so amazing the way that you managed to write an episode that takes us out of the narrative structure that you've built, but it still feels like part of the world and completely connected at the same time. Um, yeah, I mean, we're nervous about every episode that we we want people to like it. Um, that's why we make them. But but that one, yeah, in particular, you know, we really worked hard on that episode to make sure that it didn't feel um, kind of pointless, like a little, you know, uh, nothing. We we only had. 20 some minutes to deliver a movie's worth of story about these people. So, but it all grew out of this idea we had to talk about video game marketing, um, actually, and how video game marketing kind of changes and evolves the games by showing things, for instance, in the TV commercials that you can't actually do in the game. And that sort of, so we were having all these conversations about that. And we thought there was a lot of interesting subject matter there, but that it was pretty dry. So once we came up with the idea of this sort of romance that follows along, you're following along 
along this game and the life and death of this game, but then also the life and death of this relationship that really gave us a way in. And it also really connected it thematically to the rest of the season with Poppy and Ian and kind of what they're going through as creative partners and whether they're going to be able to see the other side of it. Um, so I, I think once we had the script, which was written by Katie McElhenney, who is so talented and fantastic and Rob directed it. And once we got into making it, I think we thought it was pretty cool, honestly. So once once I was like watching in the edit bay, I was like, oh, this is awesome. And, uh, and I think it's cool that we like are a show that has carved out that little place for us that we can do that if we want, um, we can, take that sort of luxury and the audience clearly is ready to go along with us so yeah uh, the next question that we have is from Sarah who's asking in a lot of your projects there's a premise of characters who are somewhat horrible or morally ambiguous people um, you know from always sunny on the extreme with fairly irredeemable characters and community on the other with relatively redeemable ones who you know and then mythic quest being somewhere in the middle and yet in most cases they're incredibly likable and relatable so how do you strike that balance in developing characters who are kind of trash human beings and feeding that chaos and at the same time making them relatable and finding the heart and the genuineness in them well i mean it's interesting because i think that nice perfect people aren't relatable at all so i only relate to people who are broken and self-serving and weird and and um petty and all sorts of the things that people are you know um so that's what's always drawn me to those types of shows is like i just find those people more interesting in my personal life and in my professional life i guess um but also in comedy, it's it's really fun. It's, I'll, I'll just speak to Sunny for a second because that's a particular one and one of my favorites to write for. It's, it's really great when characters don't have to learn lessons and get better because one of the problems you run into with writing for sitcoms is that as you grow and change and evolve your characters, they get less and less funny because they're more, you know, uh advanced and kind of aware and that doesn't mean that they're not putting their foot in their mouth as much you know and so um and there's just something funnier about more desperate more needy people to me anyway so um one of my favorite things about writing for sunny is that like it's just about taking any premise and just shoving it through the prism of these like five terrible people and picking five distinct terrible reactions or ideas or things that they're going to do like based on this this premise and I, lo I love it. I love that at the end of it, I don't have to like tell the audience like, but you should still like them. And clearly everybody does because they're watching the show. It's 15 years now. Um, but I think the same thing was true on, you know, on community was like, we let the people be a little broken. And at the end of the day, yes, they hugged and we played the nice music, but you didn't expect them to never have another problem. You just knew that that unit was really tight. And I think that that's what people relate to is like, hey, I, I'm broken, I don't do the best thing all the time. Are my friends, are my family still gonna be there for me? And that's the practice of coming back to the same TV show too, is like, you wanna see your friends and oh, they're still making the same old mistakes. You know, they haven't grown and changed and they they don't need you anymore. Um, so I don't know if any of that answered your question, but that I guess that's, I, I don't know, how, how do you write a character like that? I think you you figure out like what, makes you funny or other people you know funny in spite of all their faults and foibles and you you find um i don't know inspiration from the world as it is like people are very strange mixes of comedy and tragedy and i think just people watch and you will see it everywhere <laughs> yeah we just got a comment saying it answered the question really well. So that was perfect. Okay, great. Okay. And this super. is a really great question from Adrian. If I saying, if I'm not mistaken, this season marks your debut as a director. And I'd love to hear about how you approach that in comparison to your work as a writer and a showrunner. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, yes, I directed my first episode this year, which was very exciting. Um, how did I approach it as differently? Well, I approached it in the, in the same way in that I usually just, my, my method is just to obsess about something until I feel like nobody has thought about it more than me. So um, I just did that with the script, um, which I kind of already do anyway, you know, when we're writing them, but I just did it like 10 times more with the directing. I, um, I, uh, 
I picked an episode that I that I was really excited about. Again, written by Katie, and um, and it also happened to be a bottle episode, which my first episode I ever wrote of television was a bottle episode. And so I was like really excited thinking like, oh, this is kind of cool. The first one I direct will be a bottle. And then it turns out that they're so much harder to direct than just normal episodes. But uh, so I kind of like crazy over prepared for it. And then we shot it like a play. It was really weird and interesting. And um, I'm, I'm sure I'll never have that same experience again, but um but yeah, I just, I mean, I read some books. I, I, I talked a lot to Rob because he's been, you know, directing for a while. And um, so I tried to shadow him as much as possible and kind of pick up some tips. Um, but I also had uh, our, our director of photography, Mike Berlucci and our first AD, Emily Hogan were like my little guardian angels that just sort of carried me through the whole process and were like, don't do this, do this thing instead. And, and so I was very lucky to be like on home court with my family, you know, MQ family to support me in doing that. Um, but I really love directing and I, I really do want to try doing it again. It was, it was really fun. And honestly, what it felt like to me was just being the person who answers all the questions. That's what it feels like. They're just, people just keep coming up to you with questions and you and you're the one that has to answer them. So and did you feel like when you stepped into directing that episode that you just had such a clear idea of, of what you wanted from the cast members in working with them on a lot of the scenes because you've already been living with these characters and you're one of the people in the entire world that knows them best? Um, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I tried to um, like not go in with too many preconceptions about what I wanted it to be because I figured it would be an episode that would be best um, with some light, uh, ad-libbing and improv and things, but, um, I would, I was so blown away by how prepared they all were. I mean, we were shooting sometimes 10 page scenes where they had to know all of their lines for 10 pages. And most sitcom actors will tell you, like, they learn the scene that they're in that day. <laughs> and then that's, you know, I mean, some people are get, but they, they basically memorized the entire episode, all of them. So I could jump around and be like, no, now we're back over here. And they would all know their parts. And it was phenomenal. And it really was, it was brilliant to watch because it, I was like, oh, we've all locked in like second season. Everybody has figured it out. We've all like joined our hands and we're like, we're really kind of cooking now. And, um, and that's the episode I really felt that in. So, uh, I'm, I'm really excited for people to see it. Yeah. When, as, as a creator, when you have other directors come onto the show, what are the most important things that you want them to really know and understand about the essence of what this show is and how you really want them to communicate that as directors? When another director comes in, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think we have a certain style that we've developed on the show where we're trying to, um, you know, find ways to really elevate the look of it to make it feel really kind of premium and I don't know, just like look really good, you know, and um, but then also allow a very light comedy kind of naturalistic feel. So, uh, and that was really developed like early on by David Gordon Green, who shot the first like three episodes of the show and we're still evolving it. And, um, and in a lot of Rob's episodes in specific, I think the show really takes these like um, cool leaps uh, as far as like what our style is. Um, but, you know, we had some great directors in season one. We brought back again for season two. Um, I, I think we like having people that, you know, have done it, have, have hung around, kind of know everybody, like, um, kind of feel like the right fit, but there's been, sometimes we've had directors come in and they bring great new ideas that we weren't even thinking. And, you know, so again, it's like always a collaboration and you don't want to force people too much into seeing things your way, but that, that is the role of a, um, of a director that's coming on as a visitor is to deliver the show that they're making, not your own show through their, their thing. But, um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's fun. It's always another person to collaborate with. And, um, and I, I, I love it. I really appreciate it. 
The next question that we have is from Sadie, who's saying, hi, Megan, I'm a huge fan of your shows and I adore Mythic Quest. As a fairly shy gay teenager who has trouble with my feelings about 95% of the time, the Dana Rachel storyline makes my little heart flutter. Speaking of <laughs> identities, do you think any of the characters could possibly be autistic or autistic coded? I've been wondering about it since characters like Poppy and Brad make me feel super duper seen as someone who has ASD. And thank you so much for doing this as well. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that, I mean, Anybody who sees themselves in the show, I love that, that you, um, and specifically with our, with our romance between the two testers, like that story is so fun to write. And um, I think that the actresses are really enjoying it. They've, they've had so much input with us and talking to us about their feelings about how that story should be and, and go. And we've had really good input from our writers. Um, so we're really conscious and trying to, you know, take that seriously and how we treat it. Um, as far as the characters being autistic, you know, we haven't discussed it. Um, I mean, obviously within that world, I think um, it's definitely a possibility. I, um, I think the, I think that my answer would be that I hope that as we flesh out the world and, um, and kind of learn more and more, it seems like every year we kind of meet a couple new people that they, they work with. And this year we've, we have a few people that come in to do like this and that. And I would love to have a character that felt um, that felt representative of that. Um, and it would only be something that we would do with the proper research so that we're, you know, you don't want to get into just like stereotyping people and um, we want it to be an authentic expression of that experience. So um, I guess the, the question is if you are a writer and maybe you want to write for a show, then you can write a character like that. And we would love to, uh, <laughs> to have you and see what that, what that would be. Well, that actually leads into the next question because we've had a few questions coming in about, you know, how you got into writing. Um, so Nikki was asking, given your writing background, did you write scripts before you made your break into TV or did you break into writer's rooms after your editorial days before compiling your original scripts? And what was the first script you contributed to that made it to screen? Um, I started in print. I, I started at The Onion um, and that led me to getting some agents in um, LA who uh, were, you know, trying to, uh, they, help, they helped facilitate me applying to different like TV gigs. Um, and I started in sketch. I did a, a, a Dimitri Martin show, sketch show and realized I was very bad at writing sketches and um, sort of pivoted and then found that narrative comedy, I really loved characters and talking about, you know, why they do things in story structure and stuff like that. So um, I had to write a, um, a spec script uh, to, to be considered by shows. And I wrote um, an It's Always Sunny episode um, and it was very bad and uh, I didn't really know what I was doing, um, but I pushed through that and, uh, and it managed to get me an interview at um, at Community, and Community was the first you know sitcom that I wrote for, and uh, taught me uh, so much about um, story structure and character development. And I just loved that show. It was like my favorite one on TV uh, when I was writing for it, and I had you know friends that were in it and and writing for it, and it was really exciting, but also really stressful all the time. Cause I like kind of didn't know what I was doing and I kind of had gotten the job before I felt like I knew enough. So I, my suggestion always to people that are looking to be hired in writer's rooms is look to not just to get a job, but to build skills, meaning practice writing. I know everybody says that write a lot, but you really not only need to write a lot, but also read about story structure and how look at movies and how they're structured, compare them to the things that you're writing. Also, you can develop other skills like editing skills or shoot something on your phones. Like the, the phones that we have now have better camera. Rob's always saying they have better cameras than the ones he shot sunny season 10 on. So there's really no excuse anymore for you not to like practice and get better at doing something so that you don't end up on me, like in your first job, 
hearing some words you've never heard and having to run to the bathroom and Google it because like you have no idea what you're doing. Um, so I, yeah, I always say like, you know, people don't really want to teach you on the job. So do your best to try to develop those skills. And you can be doing that all the time and you don't have to wait for somebody to be giving you an opportunity. And also while you're doing those things, you might meet other actors, other writers, other creatives, and then they go on to do things and they remember working with you and they loved that experience. And you will immerse yourself into the worlds where you can meet people that are doing things that are akin to what you want to be doing. And um, so, of course, that's all when we're not under lockdown. Well, with the extensive experience that you have in the industry at this point, what's what's the part of, part of writing that you still find really challenging or still find the hardest that you thought maybe would have gotten a little bit easier by now? Um, turning in a script after I've written it. <laughs> I, my husband says I have never turned in a script where I wasn't in like floods of tears when I like sent the email, just absolutely sure that I was going to get fired, that nobody was ever going to talk to me again, that it was the worst thing I'd ever written that, I mean, I really, I've written, I don't know, 25 episodes now and I, it's never gets any better. It's so scary to write 30 pages of something that you think is funny and then show it to somebody else. And then they never read it on the first night. They always just leave it in their inbox for like four days. And you're just sitting there and like, I'll go through these cycles of being like, it's, it's a great script. It's the best script I've ever written. And then three minutes later for no reason, not because I've heard anything about it. It, I'll be like, oh, it's the worst. It doesn't work at all. Um, so I don't know. I, I personally, I'm, I don't know how I can ever build more confidence in my scripts, but I think that's just what makes me like stress out about them and perfect them and really work super hard to always be getting better and better. And when I see, even now my scripts get edited, you know, like crazy, um, my scripts get rewritten just like everybody else. And I always look at the final script and compare it to what I turned in and try to see what lessons I can learn from what ended up changing, um, what scenes were superfluous, they got rid of, what characters that sort of stuff. So I find that helpful. Yeah. Well, and even before we jumped into to the Q&A, you were talking about how in terms of figuring out if something's funny and handing it over, that when you would come up with an alternative line to something on set, that you used to be able to just turn to someone and be like, hey, like, do you think this is funny before you oh, say yeah. it out loud to everyone? But now, now because of COVID, distancing... you have to like shout it across the room. Like, do you think this is funny? And it's so embarrassing. I just want to, I got like in trouble from our medical team a couple of times because I like was leaning too close to David and I was joking with them. Like, I don't want to be near David. But I, I just don't want everyone to hear this stupid joke I just thought of. I just want David to hear. I'm gonna, and then we, I just started texting him. I was like, I'm just gonna text him because I can't, I, I can't be shouting my half-formed jokes. You know, there's a like Rob and David and I. We have like a little unit. We like protect each other from like saying stupid things in front of the, in front of the show and losing all their respect. So. Now everybody knows. Uh, we have this question that came in from Artie about season two saying, so far there've been two episodes where we've seen of Mythic Quest that we can point out of episodes which have a different format or setting with Dark Quiet Death and the quarantine special. Can we expect any more of those in the season? Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. And from working on, on the season of Mythic Quest, what, what are the aspects that you still feel like you're really learning on the job with this specific show that have been really unique to this series for you? Um, well, this is the first time that I've been like a boss boss of the show. I've been, you know, um, in writer's rooms before and I've been an executive producer on Sunny, but um, I was never in charge of those things. It was always somebody else that at the end of the day, if something wasn't figured out, like they were the one spending the restless night and I was going home. Um, so that's been a new experience being kind of the, the boss. Um, and I've been talking a lot about that experience with Rob and David, and we've tried to like filter some of that into the show because uh, sort of Poppy's journey this season is like, you know, she got promoted last year to like the boss. And now it's like, okay, you're in it. Everybody's listening to you. What are you going to say? And, um, you know, I still have those experiences in the writer's room sometimes where I'll notice everyone looking at me and I'll be like, oh, right. I'm supposed to talk. I'm the one that's supposed to be talking. Uh, but, um, yeah, that's been new. I mean, the directing was a whole new experience for me this year. Um, I'm trying to learn all of it. I'm trying to get into every bit of it and figure out how all of it happens because, um, I've been impressed to watch Rob be like a one man studio and, um, I need to learn how to do that. And what are you proudest of having accomplished with your work on the show so far? 
Um, I think working with the writers, especially the um, women that I have writing for, that we have writing on the show now, but um, women that I'm like, I'm their boss now. And I, I didn't have a female boss. Um, I haven't had one like uh, in my writing career. And so that's been really special for me is um, working with um, new and experienced writers and um, seeing them excel and um, being as hopefully like a good mentor to them as they go through their experience. And that's, yeah, that's been my favorite part. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to watch the second season and thank you so much for sharing all of this with us this afternoon. Yeah, thanks for having me.